Hey everyone, and welcome to another Kuno Reviews. Today we talk about the classic shooter Medal of Honor Frontline, a shooter that in my opinion is just a tad less influential than GoldenEye was for shooters on console, but nevertheless still deserves to be in that list of important and genre-defining shooters like GoldenEye and Halo 1. I loved this game when I was a kid, and with my recent jump back into World War II games, I wanted to relive those days and see if this almost 20 year old game still holds up today. GoldenEye is another game that is definitely worth looking at sometime to see if it has aged well, but for today, let's dive deeper into Medal of Honor Frontline. So the game was released in 2002, and the interesting thing is that back in this period, there sometimes were two very different versions of the same game or franchise on both PC and consoles because the differences in hardware were so big. Medal of Honor Pacific Assault and Rising Sun are two drastically different games that were each other's counterparts, and Medal of Honor Frontline shared this with Medal of Honor Allied Assault. Allied Assault offered different missions and even different settings with the first few levels taking place in North Africa. In general, the rule was that the PC version was the prettier of the two, but ironically, I think that Medal of Honor Frontline looks nicer than Allied Assault. I think it might be the models, which I think look a lot better in Frontline, and overall the colors are less bright, making it feel more like Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers. And those two were of course the huge inspirations to make this game so cinematic for its time, and that was the basic outset. Never before had first person shooter games aimed to create a really cinematic, blockbuster type of experience. Nowadays we are very used to this with games like Call of Duty, but the original makers of the first Call of Duty game worked on Frontline and Allied Assault, meaning Call of Duty's origins can be found in this game. Shooters up to that point often were considered ego shooters, where you would go through levels by yourself. There had been a few exceptions where you maybe had one or two allies here or there, but Frontline was the first for PS2 that had you fight along a lot of guys in certain levels. And with a lot, I mean a lot for the time, which is four to six guys. Just like how Saving Private Ryan began with a bang, so did Frontline. The first D-Day level is legendary, and people really did not know what they saw on their screen when they first experienced it. From the incredible sound design of machine gun fire and artillery, to the visuals of soldiers storming the beaches and getting blown to smithereens, it was an absolute joy for the senses, and it's still fun to play today. Sure, you can actually see that the beach is pretty empty, but I'm not kidding when I say that the sound of the enemy fire and artillery sounds better in this game than it does in Call of Duty World War II, where the sound design of the D-Day landings is very disappointing. I think the biggest problem that people will have nowadays is with the control scheme of Frontline. And yes, by this time Halo 1 did already come out and had a far superior button layout which we still use to this day. But basically, in Medal of Honor Frontline, you can walk and strafe with the joysticks, as in any normal shooters, but if you want to aim somewhere specific, you hold onto one of the triggers and your character will stand still so you can move the crosshair across the screen. It will be very weird to modern gamers, but that was how many shooters were on the consoles back in those days. The thing too is that the AI was made so that it could work, meaning that they would not fire as fast or were as accurate as some enemies are today, since your character would sometimes just stand still to aim. From what I understand, there is currently a remastered version available on the PlayStation Store that actually lets you aim down sights, so that might be a more to modern gamers liking. But I also understand that it makes the game really, really easy because of it. So the game really impresses and still impresses today with the opening D-Day mission. What follows then are a bunch of missions divided into chapters that will lead you through France, Holland, and eventually Germany. For some of these missions, the game takes again inspiration from movies with, for example, Band of Brothers for the third mission, where you battle amongst 101st paratroopers in a French town, which is really cool and hectic once more, only to be followed by a mission taking place on a German U-boat, having clearly taken inspiration from the movie classic Das Boot. But it's the variety of these levels that keeps the game so fresh and still so fun to play today. It's a formula that Call of Duty often still plays today with, as you basically do the same thing every time, shoot the same bad guys, but being on the beaches of Normandy in one level, and then a town under siege in the next, and then a U-boat, and then a German harbor after that, is what keeps it fresh and makes you want to see what's next. What is also really cool 
is how many different skins of enemies you will see in this game. This might seem like a weird detail, but you will basically always be fighting the same type of enemy soldier that will only differ a bit by their usage of weapon. Many games only have between 10 or 20 different skins or enemy types you fight, but in this game, you will come across at least 50 different ones, with some very unique enemies too, like the captain of the U-boat, a fat cook that throws knives at you, soldiers in sailor outfits at the harbor, engineers at the U-boat facility, to even soldiers in their underwear as you surprise them while they are asleep. It really showcases the love and detail that was put into this title as nowadays many studios would have settled for less and would have gotten away with it. It clearly shows a difference in time, since this is a single player only shooter and back in those days that meant your single player campaign actually needed to be good. It's just also little details that leave a good impression. From many objects that can actually break or be shot to pieces in the environment like boxes, but also bottles and food, it was really impressive for its time and showed what a PlayStation 2 could do. Enemies would also interact differently, showing a different animation depending on where you hit them. Now this wasn't something new. GoldenEye did this back on Nintendo 64, but still. The sheer amount of animations was quite stunning. But it is true that you are not only shooting German soldiers. You also will be tasked with multiple assignments that you can even clear in a non-linear fashion. Now this doesn't mean that the levels are open, they are very linear in fact. But you will for example get objectives where you need to pick up an paradrop or get up a tower to cover your fellow troopers as they cross a bridge or find a document hidden away in a clock. If you do not pay attention you can actually walk right past these objectives and you have to backtrack to the location if you happen to do so. This actually does offer a tiny bit of exploration but can also be maybe a bit annoying for those who are not paying attention to the mission objectives. The objectives are always in chronological order though, so you can easily see where you need to backtrack to if this is required. I actually think it is really cool that the game lets you continue playing the level even if you skip one of the objectives, and I did have a couple of times where I had to go back and explore the level a bit further. After you are done in France, the campaign shifts to Holland, and I knew that levels in my home country would be in the game. But I forgot that a very large amount play in Holland, which was really cool to rediscover. There are a total of six levels that take place there, giving the game a good one-third that plays in Holland. And these levels are really cool, though I might be a bit biased since of course I'm from there. You have a great number of varied missions here again. From the countryside with all the iconic windmills as you need to protect a member of the 82nd as he destroys multiple enemy tanks to sneaking around in a Dutch town in order to reach a bar for a legendary scene once again. At this bar, you will disguise yourself as a German officer, as you will meet a contact there. Since you are disguised, you can roam the bar freely and just see the enemy soldiers relax and have fun with each other. When the way is blocked by two guards, you need to find a way to distract them, and for a brief moment, the game almost turns into an adventure game, which is really cool. We can still even see the legacy of this mission in games nowadays, with Call of Duty World War II having of course the level where you also infiltrate a German facility in Paris as the woman. It's also cool to note that at least here, they took it serious to try and recreate the feeling of being in Holland. I can honestly say that this game's levels that play in Holland feel more like Holland than the levels in Brothers in Arms Hell's Highway. Especially the Arnhem mission feels really believable, and have multiple civilians speaking Dutch lines as well, which they deliver fine, albeit a bit cheesy. The final missions in the campaign take place in Germany, and this is the weakest part of the campaign for me, since you will be fighting in the same looking grey facilities and factories a lot. Nevertheless, there are still highlights here, like fighting on a moving armored train or in a minecart as you ride through the mines. All in all, an excellent campaign that will take you between 4 to 5 hours. My biggest complaints would be the controls, with the still standing aiming that hasn't aged well, and maybe the fact that you can easily skip objectives and are forced to backtrack, though it is also refreshing that the game does not immediately make you stop but lets you continue playing. I really think that Medal of Honor Frontline has aged well and is still really fun to play today. Medal of Honor Frontline gets an 8.4. It's a shame that the franchise really went downhill after this, with a few good games here and there, but in general the Medal of Honor franchise is gone. Call of Duty has taken over, 
and I will definitely check some of those earlier titles out as well to find out how they evolved the cinematic World War II genre. The variety in levels and enemy types in Frontline put some modern games to shame, and it's sad to know that so many companies don't abide by the same detail anymore. A lost era, unfortunately.